Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Got my friend Ari Witten here. If you missed episode 130 of our podcast, Ari and I had a deep discussion about mitochondrial health, circadian rhythms. We talked about light, melatonin, really fascinating discussion, one of our most popular podcasts. So I would definitely recommend go back, check out 130. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to touch on some of those topics, but we're really going to focus on nutrition with this one as well, because he just wrote a, a great new book, Eat for Energy. And uh, also he has a great book as well on the ultimate guide to red light therapy. So if you guys are looking for some great reading, if you enjoy this podcast, you would really enjoy his book, Eat for Energy, and also the ultimate guide to red light therapy, because we know that. Uh, light is a form of information into our nervous system and into our <clears throat> mitochondria, and it's almost basically like a form of food, right? So malillumination is to the body what malnutrition is to the body. And so you really have to understand how light impacts your, your body, your physiology, if you really want to optimize your health, as well as nutrition. And so his books really cover that in detail. And so Ari, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, my friend. It is always a pleasure to connect with you. Absolutely. Well, let's let's start. Let's touch on to begin. I know you've done a lot of work when it comes to chronic fatigue, um, and also mitochondrial health. And so, what's the relationship between fatigue and mitochondrial health? Yeah, you know, as a as a bit of background, my original interests in health were not really energy. You know, I, I've been studying health science since I was a little kid. This is a lifelong passion for me, and. People talk about you know the ten thousand hours to to mastery. Well, I've put in I think maybe forty thousand hours or something approximating that over the last twenty five years or so. And um, my original interest was more in body composition and athletic performance. You know, fat loss, muscle gain, bodybuilding, becoming a better athlete, performing better. That was pretty much my world for the first decade. And then in my mid twenties, I got very sick with mononucleosis. And then I was severely fatigued for about a year. And it was sort of through being sick and having this thing called energy taken away from me that I realized how much I took it for granted. And it it made me so compassionate and empathetic towards other people who were in that same state because I, I really watched as kind of my life fell apart, my all my hopes and dreams, my ability to to pour energy and time into. Uh, my relationships, my friendships, girlfriend. Um, I was in school at the time. I was working uh, a hard manual labor job at the time, and I, I couldn't do any of it. And um, you know that made that really shifted my focus. It was kind of the catalyst for me to to shift into an interest in energy specifically, and away from you know all the body composition, athletic performance stuff, and. In tandem with that, I saw a whole bunch of conventional doctors and natural health people, alternative health, functional medicine people. And, you know, to, to make a very long story short, I realized eventually that really none of those people had any idea what is actually controlling energy in our body, why certain people are chronically fatigued and why certain people have youthful energy levels. Like the, the main story in conventional medicine, it, there is no story. They don't have any sort of co coherent paradigm of how that works. In alternative medicine and natural health, the story was dominated by adrenal fatigue. I spent about a year of my life digging into the literature on that only to discover that the research doesn't support the idea that adrenal fatigue is even a real thing, let alone the major cause of fatigue. So then then I got really interested and said, you know, okay, well, now this is this crazy thing where nobody seems to have a coherent scientific framework to understand human energy levels. And that's when I said, well, you know, maybe I can devote sort of my passion in this area to studying that and seeing, seeing if I can make sense of the literature. And I started going into one area after another, maybe it was nutrition first, and then circadian rhythm and sleep and um, you know, and environmental toxicants and gut health. And I started digging into the research in all these different areas. And eventually after a few years of doing that, I ended up with a list of different physiological mechanisms that was probably 150 mechanisms long of all the different hormones and biochemical pathways and neurotransmitters and um, 
systems of the body that in one way or another could be related or are related to the energy story, either directly or indirectly. But it, it wasn't, you know, and so we could talk about AMPK and mTOR and testosterone's impact on energy and insulin and growth hormone and, and blood sugar levels and thyroid hormone and cortisol and melatonin and, you know, all, all these different aspects of it that in one way or another connect mm -hmm. to the energy story. But it was really the work of Dr. Robert Navio, um, who who is a researcher who at the University of California, San Diego, and run, runs a lab for mitochondrial medicine uh, there, that he published a paper in 2014 called The Cell Danger Response. And that paper really revolutionized our understanding of mitochondria in particular. And it's... Um, you know, mitochondria have been something that we've known about for over a hundred years. And the it's been taught to us in high school and college and medical school biology classes as sort of these mindless energy generators. You know, they're the powerhouse of the cell. And but it's framed more like, you know, their role is sort of just taking in carbs and fats, pumping out energy. This paper from uh, Robert Navio basically took that and put it on its head and it said, okay, well, energy generation is one aspect of what mitochondria do. It's an important aspect, but there's this whole other role that they have as cell defenders, environmental sensors that are these exquisitely sensitive um, threat detection systems. They're constantly taking samples of the environment, basically asking the question, is it safe for us to produce energy. They're sort of like the canaries in the coal mine of our body. And, um, and, and they can sense virtually any type of threat that you can think up from poor nutrition to poor sleep to uh, environmental toxicants to psychological stress and every other thing you can think of. And in response to that, to, to the degree that they are detecting those threats, they actually turn down the dial on energy production and shift the body's resources towards cellular defense. And that fundamentally was like the big synthesis for me. That mm. took this, this whole story of energy from this 150 mechan mechanism long list of all these different pathways to, uh, you know, one that, you know, what is the most upstream thing that is really regulating and deciding how much energy our body is going to produce at the cellular level. And the most important part of that story is mitochondria. Yeah. And it's really interesting with the mitochondria and that cell danger response, because, you know, it's either peacetime physiology or wartime physiology. And in wartime physiology, they're hunkering down. They're trying to protect themselves because, you know, there's, there's high risk for danger. And so then they, be, they shut down their, their, uh, you know, energy production, or they become hypometabolic. They increase oxidative stress, a lot of different factors like that. And it's actually an adaptive physiology. You know, it's like we use terms like, okay, this is, this is pathological, but really the body's trying to do the best it can to survive a crisis that it's hoping is just going to be temporary. And the problem is when it's turned on chronically. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, sometimes people have difficulty with this. It's not always intuitive for people they might think, well, if the body's under stress, may, shouldn't we be producing more energy to overcome that stress? But it's actually not like that. When when you're under stress or when the body senses it's in an extreme environment, it it turns down the energy production and shifts resources towards defending against the threat. Mm -hmm. These these things are are two two sides of the same coin. To the extent they're they're doing one, they're they're turning down the other. Um, so, you know, an example, this is, this is true as a general principle across the animal kingdom. Um, and, and actually, before I get there, there, there is a distinction between acute stress and chronic stress. So uh, under acute stress, let's say the proverbial, you know, very cliche, like a tiger's chasing you mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, there's certainly an argument that in mobilizing energy is a very valuable thing in that context. So you know, that's, that's one kind of stress that the body can respond to this very intense, acute sympathetic activation, but that's a very different kind of stressor than let's say chronic sleep deprivation or, um, chronic psychological stress or, 
or uh, chronic poor nutrition, you know, nutrient yeah. toxicities, nutrient deficiencies, or um, chronic exposure to environmental toxicants, right? The body responds differently to those kinds of things. Um, they're different at the signaling level. Now, um, across the animal kingdom, we see this kind of response. So from microscopic organisms like tardigrades, these little water bear creatures that go dormant in response to extreme stress, to worms that go into a state called dour, to mammals like bears and squirrels and other creatures like that, that, that go into a state of hibernation when their environment becomes more harsh, mm -hmm. when the, the climate becomes more extreme. Um, and it's, and you know, with these microscopic creatures, as soon as they get the signals that the environment is no longer harsh, rather it's a toxic exposure or extremes of temperature or pressure or what, whatever else has caused them to go into this state of sort of dormancy. As soon as they detect the environment is safe again, they turn the engines back on, right? And, um, you know, as a, as a further analogy, let's imagine you were in a war zone right now and the enemy army threw a bunch of poison gas in the street outside your home, it would be a, it, it would not be smart to carry on business as usual and say, well, let's open the windows and let some fresh air in. Let's let's go outside and go for a walk in the park and play with the kids in the playground, right? And do our normal energetic sort of duties. Instead, what you do is you close the windows, you close the doors, you lock yourself inside and you hunker down, as you said, to protect yourself from harm, from that exposure of that threat. So, um, and that is exactly what cells do. And they literally do it at the cellular level and at the mitochondrial level where they are, for example, hardening the cell membranes, stiffening the cell membranes to decrease communication between cells um, and decreasing energy production at the mitochondrial level and uh, throwing off more free radicals at the mitochondrial level. So for example, one, one type of threat is um, a, a pathogen, let's say a, a respiratory infection, viral infection. Um, part of the mitochondrial response to that is to turn off energy production or turn down energy production and start throwing off lots of free radicals, reactive oxygen species. And that is actually part of our um, part of our immune response, part of the innate immune response that is designed to be toxic to that pathogen to help fend it off and kill it. And we seal the, the cells off so that the viruses have a harder time going from cell to cell. And um, we try to lock them in and the cells will also even self-destruct. They, they will seal themselves off and then try to produce so much toxic mm. free radicals to kill whatever's there, whether it's a toxin or a pathogen or something like that, that they the cell will essentially sacrifice itself in an effort to to defend the broader system of the body. So, you know, these are these are the kind of principles of how our body works. But the basic idea, again, is to the extent you have threats, your body's turning off the energy production machinery. Yeah, really fascinating how the cells is actually in a very intelligent response. The cells will actually sacrifice themselves for the good of the whole. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's going on there. And we experience it like when we have a flu, like you're talking about one day, we might feel great, might exercise, feel really good. And then the, that night, you know, the flu comes the next morning, we have no energy, we're throwing up, right? We feel awful. We feel massively inflamed. And that's really the cell danger response uh, taking place, right? And so it, it can it can shift that quickly. Now, in your book, you talk about um, you know, a number of different things you talk about in the beginning, you start with circadian rhythm and how that influences mitochondrial health. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the way that circadian rhythm interfaces with this story of how mitochondria work is, uh, is really interesting and, and multifaceted. So one aspect of it actually centers around, uh, melatonin. So, yeah, actually, you know what? Before I get there, let me explain circadian rhythm. Um, how mm -hmm. how sophisticated is your your audience, Doctor Jockers? Is it they're mostly pretty sharp? They're pretty sharp. We talk about circadian rhythm a lot, um, but yeah, you can give an overview for sure. Uh, okay, so the very quick overview is we've got a central clock in the brain that's primarily responsive to what's called the Zeitgeber, the environmental input of light. Right. So um, blue light is this daytime signal. And, uh, and obviously it needs to be at the right timing. We want to get lots of it in the morning and throughout the day, and we want it to turn off 
in the evening as we're winding down towards bed, mimicking the rise and fall of the sun as much as possible. Okay, there, there's a lot to that story of, of light, but we'll keep it there for now. A more recent scientific discovery is that we have tons of peripheral clocks, peripheral circadian clocks in virtually all the tissues of our body from uh, you know our intestines to our liver, to our heart, to our muscles, to our bone, to our skin, to our hormone producing glands. You know, they all have these, these biological clocks built into them. And what we want is to as much as possible synchronize those uh, peripheral clocks with the central clock in the brain. And there's a few different ways that, that we can do that. Um, in, in, as a result of doing that, what do we get, right? Well, the circadian rhythm, both the central clock and the peripheral clocks working together, coordinate all kinds of metabolic functions. There's many different hormones that are directly tied into this circadian system. Um, the most well-known of which is cortisol, but also we have testosterone, growth hormone, melatonin, um, and, and thyroid hormone, and many other hormones that are either slightly or very strongly tied into this circadian rhythm. Um, many neurotransmitters are tied in as well. Dopamine, serotonin, GABA, orexin, which is a wakefulness neurotransmitter. They're, they're all linked and yoked to this circadian rhythm. Um, there was a wonderful quote that I heard recently uh, from a, a, a British health expert named Phil McCanns. He said, um, talking about these hormonal rhythms that are tied to the circadian rhythm, he said, uh, you know, there's a famous quote that goes like, if you, if you have an orchestra, but, but um, no conductor, you have noise. If you have an orchestra with a conductor, you have music. So this is an important yeah. distinction because um, it is possible to measure your hormones and let's say have a particular amount of a hormone that is within normal range, not necessarily high or low, abnormally so. Um, but that doesn't speak to hormonal rhythms. These hormones need to be tied to one another and, and be organized in, in a, as a form of a symphony, as a form of a music where they're all working uh, together in the right patterns and rhythms. And that is largely a function of the health of our circadian rhythm. Um, I'll mention one other aspect of this, which is that there's a few different ways that the circadian rhythm also ties into mitochondria directly. Um, one of which is melatonin. And the melatonin story is really interesting because people have known about melatonin for a long time, but it's always been talked about as like a sleep hormone or a sleep mm -hmm. supplement. Some people don't even know it's a hormone produced endogenously yeah. in our body. It's like, oh yeah, I take melatonin to sleep at night, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's a hormone produced by your body. It's produced in the brain. It's produced in the gut. More recently, it's been discovered that it's actually produced by mitochondria at the cellular level as well. They've, they've done experiments um, where they remove the pineal gland from rats mm. And they find that levels of mitochondrial melatonin in the cells of the body, like muscle tissue, for example, remain the same, even if you remove the, the pineal gland. Wow, glands. really interesting. So, I didn't know the mitochondria are producing their own melatonin. I know melatonin acts as a powerful antioxidant that can pass through the double membrane in the mitochondria, but I didn't know they were producing it in the muscles themselves. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So I'm, I, I'm, to some extent, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little there, yeah. but the, the next layer to the story of, you know, being more than a sleep hormone is, as you said, it turns out me melatonin is actually the most potent mitochondrial antioxidant ever discovered. And our, our cells, our mitochondria need to be bathed in melatonin every night um, while we're sleeping. And what does that melatonin do? Well, it, it stabilizes mitochondrial membranes and um, and redox potential across that membrane. This is like the electrical charge around the membranes, that which is critically important for basically allowing them to produce energy effectively. Um, but in addition to acting as a direct antioxidant, perhaps more importantly, what it does is it interacts with our endogenous antioxidant system, um, something called the ARE, the antioxidant response element, and it recharges levels of glutathione and catalase and superoxide dismutase in this, again, this, this internal antioxidant and detoxification system that is designed to protect our cells, protect our mitochondria against a broad range of stressors every day. So in other words, 
having adequate levels of melatonin bathing your mitochondria each night while you sleep is critical for the next day, yeah. your, your cells and mitochondria's ability to defend against all of the threats they're going to be and stressors that they're going to be exposed to, to prevent ex oxidative damage and to detoxify the, con the, the toxins. So now, given that we understand that, that melatonin is playing this critical role in helping to protect our, our mitochondria and recharge the ARE, you know, how does, how does, you know, what, what's the bottom line as far as melatonin? Well, let me give you one data point to plug into this. It's been shown that just being under standard room lighting in your home at night suppresses melatonin levels by upwards of 70%. Hmm. Okay, so this is not a small effect. This isn't like a 5%, 10% suppression effect. Most people are wiping out more than half of the melatonin that should be there every night, um, which is this critically important, it's mitochondrial protective, neuroprotective, and anti-cancer hormone that should be bathing the, those mitochondria. So um, yeah, that's, that's one of many critical mechanisms of how the circadian rhythm ties into it. But also these hormones are very important to the energy story as well, the thyroid hormone, um, insulin levels and, and blood sugar regulation, which is something we can talk about, um, testosterone, of course, growth hormone, all of these, um, and cortisol, all of these are linked to the circadian rhythm as well. They all play a role in the energy story. So anyway, I'll, that, that's, that's kind of an overview yeah. of, of, well, I also rhythm. like, I like how, you know, even though the book is titled eat for energy really started with circadian rhythm and focusing on optimizing that, you know, in the beginning, of course, you know, we're looking at more of, um, you know, the central circadian rhythm where it's like, okay, let's time out our light exposure, you know, getting more light during the daytime tells our body, Hey, like getting blue light exposure, getting early sun exposure really helps set our circadian rhythm. And then at night, as the light goes down, obviously we're trying to block out as much of that light, dimming the lights in our house, wearing blue light, blocking glasses, um, wearing an eye mask like I do every night when I'm sleeping, try to keep my room as dark as possible to, to maximize melatonin production. But then you also go into how nutrition and how you can use nutrition, how that impacts peripheral circadian rhythm clocks. This is something that most people, you know, it was the first time I really had, had I mean, I heard the concept, but really understanding peripheral circadian rhythm, it was the first time I had um, come across that term. Yeah, interestingly, you know, in the, the the story of how I sort of fell into the energy blueprint, um, as I, you know, sort of was in that initial phase of research with all those 150 physiological mechanisms yeah, yeah. I mentioned, what, one of the first parts of that story that I uncovered was about circadian rhythm and how nutrition ties into it. And I was very, mm. I was really fascinated with that. So, um, you know, again, we need to synchronize all these peripheral clocks with the central clock. So there's a light aspect to that story. And then there's a food aspect to the story. The, the primary zeitgeber for these peripheral clocks is nutrition. So how do we do a couple things? We want to first optimize all those peripheral clocks with the nutritional inputs. And we need to synchronize the two, the peripheral clocks and the central clock. So um, the first important principle of that is that there is a clock aspect to this, which means just as there is an optimal timing and window of time for you to be getting light into your central clock, there is also an optimal window of time for you to be getting food into your peripheral clocks where they want and um, have a need for processing nutrients in order to perform their functions at their best. And there's a window of time where they don't want the food coming in, in order to perform those other functions, the best, you know, we, we fluctuate between physiological processes that we do at daytime versus nighttime, anabolic and catabolic processes. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters that are tied into this that are either high or low, depending on what phase you are. And, um, while many people, I think have a tendency to think our physiology is stable, just consider the fact that, Every night through no volition of your own, you enter an entirely different state of consciousness mm. for eight hours yeah. of the day. And, you know, that's that's all these physiological mechanisms, hormones and neurotransmitters, especially that are um, that are taking your brain into a different state of consciousness um, as a result of the biological clock inputs. OK, so what what is that optimal window of time? Well, um, first of all, we know from a researcher 
uh, named Satchitananda Panda, who I think wins the prize for coolest name of any uh, any any scientific researcher. Um, he did a, a really interesting experiment where they tracked people's food intake over the course of the day. They found a number of interesting things in this study. Um, one of which is that people eat way more fre frequently on average than they realize. People eat more than they realize. And um, most significantly, people's daily feeding window, 85% um, of people had a, had a feeding window that was 13 hours or more. 85% wow. of people had a daily window wow. of 13 hours or more. And that's from the first bite of food to the last bite of food. Now, they also did an intervention in that study where all they did was ask people to consume food in less than 11 hours per day, okay, which is not extreme by any means. And this, mm -hmm. this, uh, this is something we could talk about, I know, as an area of ex expertise mm -hmm. of yours around this whole time-restricted eating versus intermittent fasting. There's, I, I think, a lot of uh, conflation of terms, and people are very confused about those terms. Um but I, I would say this is not extreme at all. This this is like pretty much just a normal, non-extreme yeah. pattern of eating. And, um, and what they found is just by asking them to do that, without altering what they were eating or how much they were eating, just saying, hey, can carry on your normal diet, just try to do it in less than 11 hours per day, um, people improved their energy level and they slept better and they had improved markers of uh, metabolic health. And, and since then, we have um, many other studies that we have a huge body of evidence in animals around this. And there's many studies that have come out in humans now showing that uh, basically when you adhere to these time-restricted eating protocols, we see improvements across the board in almost every aspect of metabolic health. We see reduced oxidative stress, reduced inflammatory markers, um, inflammatory cytokines. We see improved blood sugar levels and insulin sensitivity, uh, reduced blood pressure, improved sleep, improved energy, you know, marked triglycerides, cholesterol markers, blood lipids, all these kinds of things. Um, we see improvements across the board, even again, without altering what a person's eating, or how much they're eating, just altering the window of time of when they're eating. So um, this is this is a very, very robust finding. And I would say to, to, take, to make that very practical, the research generally indicates that a window of time between six to 10 hours is optimal. Yeah, yeah, definitely makes sense. A big thing that obviously we talk about on this podcast, but yeah, I know there's there's been studies talking about like eating your meals in a 10 hour eating window lowers for women that have had breast cancer, lowers the risk of recurrence by a pretty significant amount too. I think it was like uh, like a 60 or 70% lower recurrence risk. And there could be a number of factors, obviously biological clock. Um, there's also, you know, you're just going to put out less insulin as a whole when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I know that's another big thing you talk about in the book is just blood sugar regulation and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's huge. Uh, and it's, it's huge in part because of how common this problem is for most people. So to give you a sense of it, um, consider that 30% of the, of the population suffers from reactive hypoglycemia. This is low blood sugar, um, two to five hours after eating a meal. Okay, and we can talk about the reasons why that happens. There's there's also uh, another syndrome that mimics this, the symptoms. It's called idiopathic postprandial syndrome, and they in the, in those cases, and this is another roughly one third of the population. Um, in those cases, they are able to successfully maintain normal levels of blood sugar without technically being hypoglycemic, but they have the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Um, it's still a blood sugar regulation problem. It's related and it's, it's not completely well understood, but it's thought that basically these are people who are able to technically maintain normal levels of blood sugar, but they do so by producing abnormally large amounts of some of these regulatory hormones that are involved in this. And the, the, the large amounts of these hormones that play a role in blood glucose regulation end up causing these symptoms. More importantly than that is that about 80% of the population uh, experiences 
spikes into the pre-diabetic or diabetic ranges of blood sugar on a daily basis. Now, how does that tie into the mitochondria and the energy story? Well, low blood sugar is a problem largely as a result of just not, not being able to get the fuel to the mitochondria. Okay. And, and that itself can, can be harmful to mitochondria. Um, but much more profoundly, the, the high levels of blood sugar is directly cytotoxic. It is directly toxic to your mitochondria. The, the very state of having chronically elevated, like basically a chronic energy surplus in the, in the bloodstream is cytotoxic and mitochondrial toxic. Um, it is, there's papers written on insulin resistance actually as a protective mechanism. I don't know if you've, if you've seen those, but basically it's looking at insulin resistance, not purely as this sort of pathological state, but actually as an intelligent adaptive response yeah. to essentially energy poisoning and ener chronically ener energy surplus that ends up being energy toxicity in the form of chronically elevated blood sugar and blood lipids, blood fats. Um, the, the cell tries to cr make itself insulin resistance, insulin resistant to prevent so much of that energy from flowing from the blood into the cell where it can cause damage and create that toxicity. Is so, that because of the amount of oxidative stress that is produced in the mitochondria when it's, you know, or within the cell as a whole, when you are burning sugar for fuel? Is that, is that the reason? I think because we know it, sugar it, it, is kind it, of a, it, a dirty fuel. We produce a lot of oxidative stress and we really don't get a whole lot of net ATP at the end, Yeah, but it is something we can use in an anaerobic state. And so there's advantages to using it. And there's times where we really need to be good at burning sugar for fuel, but as a whole, we are producing a lot of oxidative stress. So we don't want to be burning sugar as our primary fuel source all day long. Yeah, you know, there well there's there's a lot to say around that. Um one aspect of it is is the fact that, you know, given the different options of fuel, most cells of the body generally do choose to rely on burning carbohydrates if it's present. They right. will sort of more reluctantly shift to fats or ketones. Um if they're deprived of of carbohydrates, if carbohydrates in the diet are low enough. Um, there's also, this ties into athletic performance as well, like physical activity at higher levels of, of physical activity. The cells also very strongly preferentially use glucose. Um, I've, I've heard, you know, th there are ideas around, uh, sh you know, carbohydrates, glucose being a dirty fuel, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I don't find those arguments super compelling, I do think that that it's absolutely the case that being insulin resistant and having chronically elevated blood sugar levels is extremely toxic to the body. Mm -hmm. um, but the primary cause of that is actually excess, excess body fat. Carrying too much body fat on your body is the primary cause of insulin resistance, which is the primary cause of chronically elevated blood sugar levels and these, these spikes up into the pre-diabetic and diabetic ranges. It's also the primary cause of reactive hypoglycemia, low blood sugar levels are also tied into that story. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's also the case. Uh, I was just talking about this with, I think our mutual friend, Dr. Brian Mole. Um, mm -hmm. he said some really fascinating, uh, quote from, uh, an old timer physiologist. And I, I'd never heard this, this angle before, but one of the things we were talking about is that it's, it's, um, it's not commonly appreciated that chronically that that excess blood fats are also highly toxic to the cell. Yeah. And that diabetes is not just a state of elevated blood sugar but is also a state of bl elevated blood lipids which are right. essentially equally uh equally toxic to the cell. I I actually remember what he told me uh he said that there was a physiologist who said that um if we had the technology to measure blood lipids at the time that we were sort of working to figure out what diabetes was, we might have labeled it mm -hmm. instead of a disease of chronically elevated blood sugar, a disease of chronically elevated blood mm -hmm. fats. Now, the truth is, of course, that it's both and yeah, both yeah. both are very toxic when chronically elevated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see it with high triglycerides. 
you know, we know high triglycerides are a huge problem, but, you know, and, and we see that all the time with diabetes, but there's not really a, there's not like a, a disease or, or a, uh, you know, a condition that is labeled with an ICD 10 code for high triglycerides. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So basically just to wrap this idea up, the, 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 the cytotoxicity of the energy surplus mm. uh, from that insulin resistant state is itself sensed as a danger signal by mitochondria. So the elevated blood sugar and, um, well, I'll leave that out of the discussion for now. The elevated blood sugar is itself a danger signal to mitochondria that's shutting down energy production. Mm. Interesting. So obviously we know hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, or too much blood sugar are major issues. So in the book, you talk about some key strategies for stabilizing blood sugar. Let's go over those. Yeah. So, you know, I, I focus a lot in this book on low hanging fruit, things that are very simple and easy to do. Um, and when we're talking about insulin resistance, as I just said, the, the single most important cause to understand about what's creating these difficulties in blood sugar regulation, and particularly the chronic elevation in blood sugar is itself excess body fat. So the number one most important foundational step to resolve that situation is to reduce the, your, the body fat that you're carrying. Okay. And it's also worth mentioning that the body fat also ties into mitochondria in another way, in that it chronically produces what are called adipokines. It creates a chronic low grade inflammation in the body. And that chronic elevation in cytokines is also sensed as a danger signal to mitochondria. So both the excess body fat itself and the insulin resistance and chronically elevated blood sugar that results from it are all danger signals to mitochondria that turn down energy production. Now, um, with that in mind, and just to emphasize the importance of like how big of a factor excess body fat it is in this story. It's been shown in numerous studies that if you take full-blown type 2 diabetics, people who have been type 2 diabetics for years, and you do nothing other than restrict their calorie intake such that they lose a large amount of excess body fat in the span of a few weeks, just that one thing alone can completely cure type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm just the yeah. loss of excess body fat. And you can get you can get these people off their medications that they've been on in many cases for years. Now, the one caveat to that is if you're dealing with type 2 diabetics who have been type 2 diabetics for, you know, 3 decades, you know, they, they might have so much damage to their pancreas to the beta cells um that that you they you can't get them off medication completely. Mm -hmm. Um but in, in most cases you can, and, and literally it can be done in a few weeks. You can take somebody who's had diabetes for 10 years and cure their diabetes in a few weeks through nothing other than fat loss. Yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, I think that's, that's such a, an important aspect to this story that, that just doesn't get the sort of attention that it deserves. People often talk about insulin resistance from, you know, the perspective of all these different other specific causes, but fat gain is the number one cause and fat loss is the number one way to fix it. Now, in addition to that step, or, or I should say, unfortunately, um, fat loss isn't easy. It requires pretty monumental efforts of, of willpower and willingness to change your nutrition and lifestyle habits and behavioral change is difficult. It's very, very difficult uh, for most people to do in a lasting way particularly in the modern obesogenic environment where we're constantly surrounded by so much temptation to indulge in the foods that put the weight back on, right? Mm -hmm. And indulge in the behaviors yeah. that put the weight back on and the exposure to to toxicity. And I, we won't get into all the layers of the, the fat gain, fat loss discussion, but I want to emphasize the importance of body composition. Now, the good news is there are a few strategies that are really easy to do and don't require lots of willpower and making huge changes in your life. They're super simple. They're not difficult at all, and they can make a big difference. So one of those is eating vegetables, non-starchy, non-starchy, leafy vegetables. I can start, I uh, combine starchy and leafy there in one word. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you eat those first in the meal. Okay. 
And it's so you I'm, I'm not even saying to someone alter what you're eating. You know, I'm I am assuming that you're eating some non-starchy <laughs> vegetables in the meal, which hopefully everybody listening to this podcast is eating. You know, sort of according to some basic foundational rules of eating a, a good diet. But don't even without even altering what is on your plate or the amounts of food on your plate. The, just the order of the food, in of the order of of how you eat those foods can make a big difference. So eating the non-starchy vegetables. By itself, we have research showing that doing that one thing within the span of a couple months can take people from uh, a hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of insulin resistance, to from 8.3% down to about 6.8%, which is almost near the cutoff yeah. point for, for diabetes. So you're almost taking people from diabetic to pre-diabetic just by doing that one thing that requires virtually no effort. Right. Yeah, it's really big. And, you know, you can also do it with protein as well. And I'm, I'm an advocate of protein first, not just for the blood sugar stability, but also for good hydrochloric acid production, because a lot of people are not producing enough stomach acid to begin with, especially as they age. And whatever acid they do produce is going to, you know, just based on gravity, it's going to sit near the bottom of your stomach. So you want to mm -hmm. get the food that needs it the most, which is typically going to be your protein dense foods. In first, then I like to do, you know, all your leafy greens and things like that. And then if you're going to do the starch, you kind of do that at the end, you do your sweet potato or, you know, rice or whatever it is that you're doing for your starch, do that at the end, you're going to get the blood sugar stability, but you're also going to get better digestion that way as well. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a beautiful explanation. And that's the next place I was going with that is that there's also research on protein showing it can mm. basically do the same thing. So combining that, as you said, we're consuming the vegetables and the protein first in the meal. And I think that's a, a perfectly logical thing to do. It hasn't been tested in any study, but I, the way you explained it, I think is, is perfectly logical. Say we're going to con consume the protein and the veggies first. You can say protein first, then veggies, if you want to get real specific about it. And, uh, and then we're going to consume the rest of what's on our plate. Yeah. But, you know, again, so now you're combining two strategies there, each of which have been shown to profoundly lower levels of blood sugar and insulin resistance. And now if you combine a few other simple things into that, let's say you commit to consuming a couple grams, grams of cinnamon with your meal. Mm. Now this could be consumed by putting it on the foods potentially, depending on what you're eating. Or you can consume pills, or you can consume, um, I just put cinnamon on a little bit of water and chug it real quick. Hmm. Um, that's another you thing. You can have that, herbal tea. There's herbal teas with it too. That's yeah. true. I, I don't know if you're getting quite enough of a mm -hmm. dosage, okay. but it'll it'll have at least a little bit effect of, yeah. of an effect to do it that way. Um, but ideally shooting for around five, six grams of cinnamon consumed in a day. Hmm. Um, has a profound effect on lowering blood sugar. And then one other thing that we can add into this is vinegar. Uh, yeah. Acetic acid from vinegar also ramps up insulin sensitivity and helps pull that glucose uh, into the muscles. It helps with nutrient partitioning to get the glucose where it should go and to prevent it from... Um, mm. Um, increasing in the blood to too high of levels. So now you're combining, you know, four extremely simple, yeah. easy things without even altering your nutrition plan as a whole or how much you're eating or anything like that. But very simple, low hanging fruit that's that's low effort, that each of which has been proven to have a profound effect on lowering blood sugar levels and improving insulin sensitivity. Yeah. And the vinegar also is because of its tartness, it actually activates the vagus nerve, which stimulates the production of hydrochloric acid, bile, pancreatic enzymes. So you get better digestion as well. And that's another thing. Obviously, you talk a lot about gut health. And so we've got to be able to produce these digestive juices in order to really break down, metabolize the food effectively. And the acetic acid is also a post- Biotic, So it's a byproduct of bacterial fermentation. Mm -hmm. And that postbiotic has benefits as far as helping to tighten up the uh, the tight junctions in, in the gut, right? In the gut lining to help reduce inflammation. Um, a lot of great benefits to doing some vinegar. Now, the key is you don't want to do it. You know, a lot of people think do a straight shot. You want to dilute it. You want to rinse your mouth out afterwards mm -hmm. too. So it doesn't like... Um, actually affect and, and damage your teeth. But I, I mean, almost everybody that I have do that notices that they just digest their meal better and they feel better. They have more energy after their meal. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it can also be combined easily, yeah. like not even as a separate thing. It can be often combined with the meal True. Um, by just putting the vinegar on yeah. the veggies that you're consuming, yep. you know? So, you, you know, if, you, if you're making a, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're now you're, you're eating the protein and veggies first, you've got the vinegar directly incorporated with the veggies. So you're taking it all, all in at the same time, you know, it's very easy. It takes really no extra time. Yeah. I'm also an advocate. If you're doing uh, like something like rice or quinoa or something like that, actually putting apple cider vinegar on it tastes mm -hmm. really good. It actually improves the flavor profile of, of the starch that you're consuming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a good tip. Yeah. Yep. So good. So let's go into gut health. Cause we've talked about blood sugar. You gave some great tips. Um, let's, let's, let's move into gut health. Cause that plays a huge role with mitochondrial function. Yeah, absolutely. So as a, as a broad, you know, there's a lot going on with the gut, first of yeah. all, and there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. But as specifically in this this energy and fatigue story, we have research that's been done on people with chronic fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome. And as a body of evidence, here are the things that, that we can say about that. Um, in people with chronic fatigue, they show reduced bacterial diversity. They show increased levels of a lot of the, the bad bugs, the gram negative mm -hmm. lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin producing bacterial species. They show reduced levels of a lot of the good species like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus and so on. And uh, they show also uh, increased intestinal permeability. And uh, in several studies, they've actually shown very strong immune responses to uh, lipopolysaccharide in, in the blood and, and detecting lipopolysaccharide levels in the bloodstream. So, which is again, this, this toxin that's produced by bacteria in the gut that should not be leaking mm -hmm. from the gut into our bloodstream. And when it does causes a whole range of problems, um, it's neurotoxic, it's cardiotoxic, it promotes insulin resistance. It's associated with diabetes, neurological disease, cardiovascular disease, um, and it is directly toxic to mitochondria. So this is another signaling molecule for mitochondria that makes them go, uh-oh, we're under attack. Let's turn down energy production. Okay. So you can start to see how the gut um, ties into this mitochondrial uh, story of energy production. Now, another layer of how it ties in, you mentioned acetate before, um, but there are there are a few other uh, short chain fatty acids that are produced in the gut, yeah. like uh, like uh, propionate and uh, butyrate, especially, that are produced by certain species of bacteria in the gut in response to consuming certain nutrients in the diet. And those those short chain fatty acids are also critically important for mitochondrial function. They they do a number of things. They improve colonic health. They improve gut barrier function. They are um, neuroprotective and help brain function in profound ways. Um, highly anti-inflammatory, but also very very important for mitochondrial energy production. And if you do not have the um, a, a healthy balance in your microbiome, then you're not going to produce adequate levels of butyrate. And therefore you're going to suffer all the consequences, particularly um, higher levels of inflammation, hindered production of energy at the mitochondrial level. Now there's, there's one other uh, important layer to the story of the gut mitochondria axis, which is also that certain um, microbes in the gut they, they, they produce a lot of things. They produce certain vitamins, for example, that, um, that are needed for the body to function, but they also metabolize phytochemicals, certain phytochemicals in a particular way that produces mm -hmm. other compounds that then have physiological effects on our body. So one important example of this is something called the, the urolithins and particularly right. urolithin A. So there's a compound that, that we get in our diet called elagic acid. And that the elagic acid, or sometimes called elagitannins, is found in small amounts in a number of foods, particularly berries, uh, but it's richest in chestnuts and pomegranate by far. And those elagic, uh, that elagic acid gets metabolized and transformed by specific types of bacteria in the gut into another compound called urolithin A which is uh, pretty much the most powerful promoter of mitophagy 
that has been discovered. So if people have heard of autophagy, which is sort of the breakdown, recycling of damaged, worn out cell parts, rebuilding of new healthy cell parts, this is the same process at the mitochondrial level. It's a quality control process where our body is designed to identify and get rid of dysfunctional mitochondria and clean them out of the system so that the mitochondria you're working with are healthy ones. The mitochondria that are dividing and reproducing themselves are, are all of healthy genetic stock now and healthy structural membranes and so on. So that process, which we should be doing strongly every night while we sleep, is dependent upon the presence of certain signaling molecules. Urolithin A is a very important aspect of that. And again, urolithin A is being produced from specific phytochemicals by specific types of bacteria in the gut. So, you know, we have multiple layers of how what's going on in the gut uh, then translates into uh, what's going on at the mitochondrial level. Yeah, really interesting. And the better, the healthier the mitochondria in your gut, the more resilient your gut lining is going to be mm -hmm. to pathogens, to different environmental exposures and toxins and things like that. So it's super critical there. Let's talk, let's, let's shift into your top, you go through a lot of foods in this book, um, a lot of research that you did on different foods. Let's talk about, let's say five or six that you for sure like to include in your diet and you recommend for your clients on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing I'm big on is uh, sardines. Mm. Sardines are just a wonderful source of, uh, yeah. first of all, omega-3 fatty acids, a wonderful source of, of protein. Um, they're a wonderful source of uh, also calcium as well, which I think mm -hmm. is a undervalued but important mineral. Um, sardines are huge, great, great food to start incorporating in your diet. I will also say I was grossed out by sardines <laughs> at one point when I was younger and, and, and I've learned to like them and actually learned to love them. Mm -hmm. And what I love about them especially is actually that um, they're extremely easy to use. You know, you yeah, pop yeah. open a can, slap it on your plate and yeah. you're ready to go. Very you know? inexpensive as well. Yes, exactly. Especially per, per the amount of protein that's in yeah. them. So um, that's that's a big go-to food for me. Um, salmon roe is another one that uh, is also rich in omega-3 fatty acids and in the phospholipid form and is also mm -hmm. rich in another compound called astaxanthin, which mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of, which is a, a carotenoid pigment. This is the same pigment that accumulates in salmon that gives them their pink color also accumulates in flamingos gives them the pink color um, and just as it accumulates in their tissues to the to the point where it actually f colors their tissues um, it does the same thing in us and the cool thing about astaxanthin is that it uh, its chemical structure allows it to embed itself in mitochondrial membranes mm -hmm. across the double membrane of mitochondria and stabilize and protect it from damage um, and there's, there's a lot of uh, research around the ability of astaxanthin to do that as an added bonus. It also acts as an internal sunscreen protects the skin yeah. from UV damage as well. So, um, we have a, a robust amount of research around that and a wide array of benefits associated with that. And you just um, think about salmon. I mean, they, they're the only species that swims upstream. So against mm -hmm. the current, so you think about the amount of energy production and they're able to jump like 20 feet out, yeah. out of the water. The amount exactly. of energy production, they're like Olympic athlete fish. Yes. Yes. 100%. Um, liver, especially beef liver mm. is like nature's multivitamin. I mean, incredibly rich in, in B vitamins, um, zinc, copper, you know, many, many other, um, important vitamins and minerals are in there. So I highly recommend consuming it. It's so rich in those minerals that there's actually a concern with eating too much of it and becoming toxic. So, mm. um, you know, two, maybe three times a week is what you're shooting for. And, um, you know, to be honest, I'm not crazy about the taste of beef liver, <laughs> but, um, I do like chicken liver actually, uh, which is almost as good. Yeah. Have you tried um, heart? Yeah. Heart heart's great. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to eat. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the, one of the tricks that you can do is sort of, you, you can make stir fries, you can mm, chop yeah, it up yeah. or grind it up into small bits and mix it in with burgers. And it, right. in the context of a burger patty, let's say that's 20% liver. You don't even notice the taste. Yeah. I actually find it enhances the taste in that, in that kind of yeah. context. Um, so yeah, uh, I would say as far as animal foods goes, maybe I'll mention one other one, which is oysters. Oysters mm-hmm. are also amazing um, sources of zinc and selenium and iodine, um, as well as omega threes. And you, when you eat them raw, you're getting those those fatty acids in an uncooked, undamaged state as well. Yeah. Um, and these foods are also really important for um, neurotransmitter synthesis in the brain. So. Right. Uh, a couple others, I'll mention leafy greens. Of course, everybody knows leafy mm-hmm. greens. One thing that I'll say on that is um, prioritize leafy greens that are rich in nitrates um, and really focus on boosting the nitric oxide production in your body. Because uh, especially as we get older, there's so many things, particularly environmental toxicants that disrupt the nitric oxide producing systems of our body. And it, it hinders blood flow, it increases blood pressure, and it decreases micro- microcirculation, like getting mm. the blood and the oxygen to our tissues and to our brain effectively and to our muscles effectively. And that's another mechanism that can really hinder our muscle function, our brain function, our mitochondrial function if they're chronically sort of at a low level, not being, not getting adequate levels of, um, of blood supply and oxygen and nutrients. Um, I've started testing nitric oxide levels in myself and in many other people like family members and friends lately. And I've been pretty shocked actually to discover how common really low nitric oxide levels are. Hmm. Um, so what are some warning signs there? Like cold hands and feet, brain fog. Cause you'd have like lack of perfusion potentially, areas, yeah, yeah potentially, but, but as you know, none of those symptoms would be specific yeah. to my micro- microcirculation right. that could also be caused by other things. Um, but it, it can be a contributor to many different kinds of symptoms. I mean, even something like erectile dysfunction, it can yeah. contribute to, mm-hmm. right? Blood flow affects everything, the function of pretty much everything in our body. So optimizing nitric oxide production and yeah. blood flow is important. And now you mentioned uh, greens that were rich in, in nitrates. Nitrates. That, yeah. Nitrates. So, arug- so which ones arug- would those be? Arugula is amazing. Uh, well, arugula is my favorite. It's also lower oxalate too. Yeah. So, so yeah. arugula yeah. is amazing. Uh, beets are amazing though, not low in oxalates. And, uh, you know, so if you're, if you're not oxalate mm-hmm. sensitive, yep. that yep. can be a thing for you, you know, going back to the gut microbiome briefly, it's interesting to note how malleable and dynamic the microbiome is yeah. and how it shifts in response to what you eat. You know, if you start consuming more alcohol, you get certain shifts. If you start consuming more of this or that, you get certain shifts. Um, But there's a species of bacteria called oxalobacter Mm -hmm. that consumes oxalates. And so if you eat oxalates commonly in your diet, you start growing much more of this particular bacterial species that likes to feed on oxalates. So um, anyway, the uh, yeah, so getting those those dietary nitrates from those food sources is, is critically important. And, uh, and then the last one I'll mention is, um, broccoli sprouts. Mm, So for you know, it's become more well-known at this point, people have heard about it, but it's probably worth emphasizing how, how special that is as a compound. I mean, there's so much research on neuroprotective, anti-cancer, pro-detoxification, mitochondrial protective, mitochondrial biogenesis stimulating properties of sulforaphane. And it's incredibly cheap and easy to grow at home in a, in a glass jar, you know, for pennies a day, you can get one of the, one of nature's most powerful superfoods. Yeah, there's something called an in garden that I have where it's like basically it's just panel and it's actually got UV light that comes down. And uh we get we get seeds. We have mustard green sprouts, we have radish sprouts and broccoli sprouts. I don't know exactly like obviously broccoli sprouts have the highest level of sulforaphane, but I'm interested to know. I don't know if we've studied radish sprouts, mustard green sprouts well enough. But I'm sure there's some incredibly powerful compounds that are produced there as well. But something that my family, we use every day, we just take a little scissors, we cut the sprouts, <clears throat> put them on our food, and it's simple and easy. And it's very, very low cost. I mean, you know, we could grow them outside if we wanted to, but it's simple. You can just grow them right on your windowsill. 
Yeah, absolutely. What was the name of the, the it's thing called you said? In Garden. In Garden. Yeah, In Garden. All one word. Yeah. Check that out. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of uh of all those foods. And maybe as a final one, I'll mention spirulina. Um, technically people often think of it Love as a supplement, but really. but I, I'll put it in the food category. Um spirulina is not just a bunch of hippy dippy sort of new age nonsense. <laughs> it, it's it's really legit at yeah, the scientific yeah. level. We have lots of research showing uh, that spirulina is a true superfood. Um, there are situ we've, we have studies where it's been shown to improve endurance performance, improve energy levels, um, widespread improvements in metabolic markers, um, you know, decreased LDL, increased HDL, decreased blood sugar levels, decreased blood pressure, um, you know, on, on and on and on decreased oxidative stress. It's a very powerful antioxidant, this compound in it called C phycocyanin mm. and, um, spirulina is yeah a, a really incredible compound yeah and it increases your sod levels superoxide dismutase levels which there's not a whole lot of things that do and yeah. it's also a very rich source of melatonin as well oh interesting i haven't heard that yeah i yeah, didn't spirulina. know the melatonin aspect i don't know if you've interviewed uh or talked to Catherine arnston from uh energy have, yeah. but yeah mm -hmm. she's been doing a lot of research with that and uh, found that it's one of the one of the richest food sources actually of melatonin. So, Interesting. I, I had yeah. not heard that. That must be a new finding because I've read a lot on yeah. spirulina. I've never seen that before. Yeah, if you go to her site, Energy Bits, they've got uh, they got some research out. They've got some uh, articles and things like that on it. So yeah, yeah really interesting. But great. I love spirulina. I use spirulina every day. Chlorella as well. Um, what are your thoughts on a couple other of my favorites? Resveratrol. As far as supplements. Yeah. Um, resveratrol has some positive data. It's, it's become kind of controversial. You know, it was mm. a really hot thing on, in the anti-aging supplement world 10 or 15 years ago, and everybody was on it. Everybody was talking about it. And then it kind of fell out of favor for a while, um, largely because there was a, a number of studies showing that it has quite low bioavailability. Mm. And so, you know, some of these studies show showing things like, you know, 2%, 5% bioavailability. And then people started to say, ah, you know, that's kind of a bunch of nonsense because, okay, you can, you know, do these studies in mice that extend longevity, but um, really in humans, it has very low bioavailability. So it's all a moot point. Um and then more recently, it's come back into the the, the play as uh, particularly as David Sinclair, the um, Harvard longevity mm -hmm. researcher, has sort of popularized it because he's done a lot of research around that. And uh, and so now people are talking about it a bit more. I think the bioavailability aspect of it um, is something that can be overcome. You know, you can you can do uh, liposomal formulations and things mm -hmm. like that. Um then, you know, you also have characters like, you know, the, the carnivore diet types of people who are trying to demonize these phytochemicals as toxins and that need to be avoided because they're trying to kill you and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I think overall the research on resveratrol is, um, compelling and, and obviously very positive. It's, just a question of, you know, how much benefit you're getting from it and what's the bioavailability. And I, I think there's still some questions there. I know there's another compound related to it called pterostilbean, P-T-E-R-O, yeah. mm -hmm. stilbean, um, that is similar to resveratrol and is kind of, uh, I forget what they call it. It's like kind of like an isomer. It's chemically almost identical to resveratrol and seems to have a lot of the same uh, effects. Um, but with higher bioavailability and some people are promoting that as being more effective. Hmm. Interesting. I was, I was saying that because I've actually noticed clinically using a combination of resveratrol, obviously using omega threes and different things like that, getting inflammation down. Uh, but then also using resveratrol and quercetin in higher kind of clinical dosage, like around 200 to 400 milligrams of resveratrol around 500 to a thousand milligrams of quercetin does really good for, uh, improving perfusion, blood flow, mm -hmm. um, improving nitric oxide. That's what I've seen clinically. Yeah. But uh, I believe know it. if you had seen research on that. Yeah. I haven't seen it specifically on nitric oxide, but I believe yeah. it. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, great. This has been a really great interview, guys. I want to encourage you to get it, get Ari's new book, Eat for Energy. We just scratched the surface. He goes through a lot more in detail. Um, we didn't really get as deep into nutrition as he gets in the book. So again, if you love this podcast, the kind of stuff that we nerd out on here, you are going to really love this book. So check it out, Eat for Energy, and also pick up his book on red light therapy as well. Because again, light therapy is really arguably just as important as the food you put in your body is the light you're being exposed to. So those books will really be great companion guides to help optimize your energy, your brain health, beat fatigue, and supercharge your mitochondria. So check that out. Ari, thanks for coming on the podcast. Any last words of inspiration for our audience here? Oh, last words of inspiration. Um, well, I'll say, you know, one thing we didn't get into at all is supplements. Uh, yeah. And, and um, I, you know, I kind of, I took a lot of pride in the supplements chapter in the book. It's lengthy. It's encyclopedic. The book has almost, has over a thousand references. I think uh, that's going to be the, our next interview in a, in a few months, we'll come back and we'll just do supplements. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that that's a great topic. And yeah. you know, I, I, you know, this what's, what's in that supplement chapter on boosting energy isn't just, Hey, take caffeine and stimulants. Right. Um, uh, and, and this is something we didn't talk about, but caffeine and stimulant use is actually quite counterproductive mm. when, when done in the long term. Uh, for energy production. It's an insidious thing because people don't actually realize it's harming yeah. their energy levels. But um, that last chapter of the book, I would say is worth the price of the book by itself, because there's so much amazing research on so many different non-stimulant uh, compounds that have been shown to improve energy levels in those with chronic fatigue. So I, I would just say, go grab, eat for energy. Yeah. So good. All right. Thanks again, Ari. Guys, check out the book and we will see you on a future podcast.